All right, welcome. I am Rebecca Muller, and you are here on Learning Revolution with Exceptional Circumstances for Exceptional Learners. Um, this is a very exciting time um, because there are so many unknowns. Um, you know, I feel like someone said to me that in March we had a crisis, but now that it's August, we're approaching these unknowns and we're approaching the fact that some of our districts are, are, or are, you, you could say our states are not supporting us the way that they need to. So therefore being special education teachers, we see a lot um, of unprecedented things on a normal basis. So during COVID-19, it has been um, even more so. Um, I'm sure we all have stories that we can share um, that are heartbreaking. Um, and so I think the idea is what can we do to make sure that we're on the right path, that things are going to improve, that we can take this opportunity of COVID and maybe right some of the wrongs that were occurring prior to all, all this. Um, so um, I did, we might be go going a little bit out of order today, um, but that's okay. Uh, so what is an advocate? So I would love, I'm just gonna go down the line. I am going to ask you to speak, um, either speak or you could write it in the chat if you're um, not Avail available, but you know, what is an ad advocate? So by definition, it's one that argues for a cause, a supporter, a defender, an advocate of civ civil rights, one that pleads in another's behalf, a lawyer, all right? But I want you to tell me what is one word or phrase that comes to mind when you think of advocacy for special education? Um, so I'm just gonna go down my uh, list here. Anna, if you don't mind going first. Here's my home, but I did not wanna miss that. Okay. Um, how about Wayne? Do you have uh, a- I, I, I guess, I guess uh, Rebecca, uh, a believer, a believer in something. A believer, I like that. Ashlyn? if you would like to participate, maybe. Feel free to write in the uh, text as, as well. All right. All right, so as we're talking about special education ad advocates, you know, we're looking for that support. We're looking for um, try to see through their eyes. Justice for all stu students. Thank you so much. Um, uh, you know, it's being able, I love that, to stand up for s someone who cannot stand up for them themselves. Absolutely. Um, and in the world of special education, a lot of times that does come down to money, right? Things that we need cost money, which means that we have to advocate for that a lot of times on the legislative level. I come to you today after being very uh, impassioned and excited after the special education legislative sum summit for the past two weeks. Um, the New Jersey Council for Exceptional Children. Um, those of you might actually be a part of Council for Exceptional Chil Children in your state, but I was able to work with this fantastic team of um, and members who came together on a Sunday night, put together a presentation, and instead of going to actual Cap Capitol Hill to speak up for the things that our students need, we did it virtually and it was really an, an interesting thing and it was very different from uh, being on the, the hill. Um, some of them were supposed to join today. I don't see them right now, so I'm gonna move ahead. My apologies. Um, and to introduce someone that uh, helped me 
get to the first time that I got to lobby on the Hill, and that was for the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, so I had met Ted at the 2011 Council for Exceptional Children, um, the conference at uh, in National Harbor in Maryland. And um, we met at one of the smaller committee meet meetings for international special education. And um, at the time in 2012, when the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability was um, looking to be ratified in the, in the Senate, um, he reached out to me knowing that I was living in DC at the time. And I was able to meet up with a group on the Hill and go door to door and attempt to speak with the senators. It was a very interesting um, uh, experience. And um, I would love for uh, Ted to talk a little bit more about some of his roles and how um, he was involved with that whole process. So Ted, take it away. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me to be here. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, I really don't know where to begin other than <laughs> to say it's an honor to be here. Um, the disability movement is a, a civil rights movement, a global civil rights movement. And um, my involvement really began when I started, I had completed my master's in special education and had realized I knew nothing about the disability rights movement. And that really was an eye-opening experience for me because I had been involved in human rights and um, you know, Amnesty International, um, but I just never really understood how important the Americans with Disabilities Act was for the global movement for human rights. Um, so that really was the driving force behind my desire to become more knowledgeable about those issues that people with disabilities face outside my classroom, um, which I know m is much more prevalent now than it was um, back in the uh, ancient days when I started um, teaching. Um, and I'm not that old, but anyway, <laughs> I, I like to joke. Yeah. Um, I like to joke that you know I was born and raised in New Jersey. Um, and in 1973, I was um, at a school that had no idea how to handle a person with attention deficit disorder. Um, and the child find and the child study team had just been actually theoretical, um, came out of Rutgers. And um, I was one of the first people to actually be analyzed in that manner. Um, so I like to joke that I've actually been involved in special education for over 40 years. But um, if it wasn't for my mother and her uh, unwillingness to allow me to be uh, placed um, in a corner and, and to just get by in life, I never um, would have graduated high school. Uh, and I want you all to know how important you are for the lives of all of the students you work with. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that... Um, Sometimes as a parent, you don't know what your child needs. And I think parents very much rely on the teachers. I think that talking to some of the parents um, as we were brought to re remote learning, they realize that, wow, I didn't realize all the behaviors or I didn't real realize how far behind in math they actually were. And one of the outcomes from last week was we have to be very intentional with our communication. We should have been and doing that before, but now we kind of don't have a choice. And with the advocacy piece, um, just thinking about what do we have to do to make sure that our kids are getting what they need now, right? It was important then, there's been a lot of things to kind of, you know, get it done. You know, when we're thinking about the federal, it's pretty much we're talking about the almighty dollar bill, right? right? But aren't there other things that we could be doing in a more local way to ad advocate? Um, 
you know, and when we think about standing up for people who can't stand up for them themselves, you know, it, it can't all come down to money, right? Like what else can we be doing? If it was money, then it would be solved uh, because inevitably money, the direct funding would be leading to progress. And the human element is uh, an important element, uh, is probably the most important element to success in the field that we're working in. And that human element is just so vital. Um, I would like to add that I think that this year is a particular, particular challenge because inevitably we're dealing with things that we haven't dealt with before. We're dealing with issues that um, parents themselves and we personally are going through. So how we've done things in the past is, is even more important now. Um, I love the way you mentioned that communication element. Um, to me, I found that I had almost no knowledge of disability the disability community outside of my nine to five, Monday through Friday school day. Um, and that while I might know um, various leaders when they came to IEP meetings, I really didn't understand their structure. I didn't understand how state agencies worked with each other. I didn't understand how Medicaid or Medicare was affected. Um, it really, really took me time and effort to really understand, and even now I'm still um, learning new things every day on how the disability rights um, movement and people with disabilities, the, the, the issues they face, their families face. So you add that on top of this idea of how serious the challenges we're going to face coming in a few weeks, at least here in South Carolina, um, it's, it's going to be quite a, a, a dramatic challenge for mm. us. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that <laughs> So many of us right now are seeing a lot of the problems. Yeah, I'm in a conference. And I, I very much would love to know what the solutions are. Like, should we be writing letters to governors? Should we be writing letters just to the super intent? intendant? Because not only are we advocating for the learning and the services, but a lot of our students have, we need to advocate for their health. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the teachers out there are worried about their own health with all of the misinformation. Yes. So you also, in order to be a strong educator, you need to sometimes advocate for yourself. Um, and I think that that becomes hard in the world of special ed because we want to be there for our students students we, we we know that we have these tools that can help them and you know it, it it creates an interesting environment um of you know are we logging um our services for academics or does our focus need to be on the social emotional piece for the next few few months um to go back to the money piece, um, I was uh, on a phone call with Leslie Lipson, who is a advocate in Georgia. And I know she is an advocate because the minute I said the word advocacy, she jumped on and called me and we had a great talk. Um, Cause so many times they are people who do believe in a great cause. Um, you know, you don't walk into the world of special education for the fame and the glory. <laughs> you know, you are here because you truly believe in education or for the rights of 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 these kids. Um, and we and we got talking a lot about com compensatory serv ser services. And when we hear that, we think, oh no, they're going to ask us for money or they're gonna to wanna to be sent to a special school. And um, even in my administrative uh, pro program, the there's such a, I think, la uh, misunderstanding of what special ed entails. Sometimes I think that it's viewed as a burden and it shouldn't be. Um, you know, so much of what we do in our classes can benefit many students students um and we were talking about the language in special ed 
you know, do we need to change some of our language so that it's not viewed in a cert certain way? And I definitely see the intersectionality with all this. I know some someone here said that they were active in the NAACP. We have a whole other world of ad, ad advocacy right now and the intersectionality with the disproportionate num numbers of black males in special ed. Is changing the language something that would help us? You know, we talk about it with racial inequality, changing some of the vernacular so that, you know, it's not just race, racist, but anti-racist. What does that look like in the world of, of special ed? And I will kind of open that up if anybody wants to like, and like I said, feel free to raise hands. I really would, would love um, a conversation. Um, and uh, I did just have um, Danny who was a part of the New Jersey CEC jump in. Um, so in just a minute, we're gonna kind of segue back to um, the work that we did last week. Um, does anybody kind of have an idea around that? Do you think the language matters and would that help us with the world of ad advocacy? I also, just so you know, you know, because uh, this is kind of all new to me, um, I'm learning a lot as I go. And um, as you can kind of see, I really want a discussion. I think we're so used to just sitting and listening. I want this to be a place of um, collaboration. So if for some reason you wanna speak and I'm not seeing a hand raise, um, let me know through the chat. All right, so if language matters, what language? What do we have to change? Um, in my case, the school where I was focusing on um, SEL, it's not as easy as it seems. I completely agree. Um, we need to make sure that the parents and get it too. I love the idea of pe people first lang language. It's not an autistic person. It's a person with aut autism. Um, my certificate is not a, you know, it's a student's with disabilities, it's no longer the disabled. Um, I think that that matters too. Um, but you know, like I've heard things, you know, in my Google Classroom, I don't wanna have the word special ed or I don't I wanna use SPED. You know, I wanna say that it is the mathematical magicians or something to kinda, you know, give empowerment. Cause I think with advocacy comes empowerment and um i someone on here was talking about young adults like transition is huge i would love to do a talk on transition so if any of you are interested please let me know because talk about advocating for them to be able to stand for themselves and what that looks like outside of the k to 21 span um so Danny, since you are here, uh, I'm going to go back a little bit so that we can share um, some of the work that we did. Um, I know, Ted, you have so much more to kind of um, talk about, but uh, we, you know, I am so great, grateful you're, you're here and hope, hopefully we'll be able to have more dis discussion as, as we go. So, um, Danny, are, are, are you good? Are you there? I'm good. I'm here. Yay. <laughs> wonderful. Hello. Um, so Hello. I, I, I talked briefly just about the work that we did and what this looked like. Um, we talked a little bit about um, legislation and advocacy on the Hill. This year was a little bit diff different. I know this wasn't your uh, first time, so I would love for you to kind of share the differences, um, kind of a little bit more about who we are and anything like that. Sure, well, it was my first time virtual. I've never stormed the hill virtually. So that was definitely, uh, it was a learning curve, but I do 
feel that we were able to book more appointments going virtual than we were uh, usually when we're in person. I see Julie just joined us too. So Julie oh, jumps in anytime. Yay! <laughs> Our other team leader. Um, so just to, to backtrack, um, for those of you that are not familiar with the Council for Exceptional Children, CEC is the special education group. Um, we are national and international. We have over 26,000 members um, across the country and internationally. And we, um, we advocate for our students and youth with exceptionalities. We write the standards for our professionals and we also provide professional development. And every year we have our special education legislative summit. So it's really um, a few days of being very in-depth and in intense policy learning and you know we learn everything about anything and then on our last day of the convention we go to capitol hill and we meet with our representatives and our senators and really uh like we were talking about before advocating for for our students for our professionals um for those in special education so this year it was virtual it was interesting uh, but it really, it was awesome because I think we had a, a bigger team from New Jersey representing us, which was great. Um, and the collaboration between all of us, um, it was just so exciting to have uh, a group of educators come together, work together. And honestly, having never met each other, I think Julie and I are the only two that may have met prior to all this. We knew each other prior, but not knowing anyone and coming together for a common cause. Uh, really spoke volumes for, you know, the work that we did and in speaking with our representatives. So I'm super proud and I can't wait to see the, the, um, the impact of what we did and, and we, what we spoke about to see, you know, what, what's going to happen from that. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I feel like with my experience, my first experience, 21 with Rose colored glasses. I'm going to change the world. I'm on Capitol Hill. This is so exciting. And then you go and you sit there and you wait with a letter and maybe somebody talks to you and maybe you're a checkbox on the wall. Right. It was right kind of Washington. Yes. <laughs> so it was very much a, um, I kind of left empty because I felt very just kind of alone in this large building and it made me wonder how anything ever gets done. Um, but then with this, with the virtual, one, I felt empowered by the team. Two, I felt like whoever was the representative talking to us, I felt like they actually had our attention and we were actually being listened to. Um, and that was, you know, I hope that that matters. Um, I felt like there was more of a personal connection that if they need needed to reach out to us, maybe they actually would, I don't know. Um, but I guess, you know, what can we be doing? Because we can't always be a part of a legislative sum summit, right? That was a great thing and, you know, an organization, but what can we do if it's just me? It's just Rebecca and I'm sitting here in Collingswood and I want to make sure that, you know, my kid is getting what they need, or I want to make sure that, you know, people in my state are listening to, to, to us that the things that we learned on a national scale need to happen here or like in a couple of the other states, if they're not as strong, how can I connect with someone from another state and help them? What does that look like? Uh, Dr. Good or Danny or Ted or anyone else if you want to join in. I'll take a crack at that. Um, the first thing is that your voice is so important. Um, I think there's a natural tendency to feel like because the, the skies didn't open up that um, you didn't make an impact, but you do. You really, really do. Um, what are some other ways to amplify that impact? Include things like you certainly need to have a Twitter account. Twitter carries, uh, in fact, there's talk now on the Hill that it carries too much weight. But Twitter and social media is part of the reason why they are listening to you in a new way now, because shows like this make an impact. Uh, and grassroots organization is now, um, and it's been, you know, industrialized. It's gotten to the point where 
you really can make a big impact and you in New Jersey being so close to Washington, um, you, it gives you an ability to communicate in a way that let's say someone from California or, or, or Seattle or Alaska just don't have that opportunity. New Jersey's a, a wealthy, powerful educational leadership state with a large legislative delegation and a large legal um, element to it. So um, you're important and your courts are important. I would strongly suggest that all of you consider finding out who your representatives are and particularly your congressperson. That congressperson needs to see you. They need to see you in the community. So when you walk into their office in Washington, they recognize you as well and say, okay, um, this is somebody who I need to listen to because she influences or he influences the votes at home. Um, that is also another reason why I think it's important to tie into other, other groups. Uh, think about serving on a board outside of, of the education realm. Uh, the National Council for Independent Living, for instance, Nickel is, is a fantastic organization that really looks and focuses on what happens to our students when they um, age out of our programs. And that cliff there is a, is a serious cliff. Um, and I'm sure some of you all have experienced turning around and seeing what happens to your students when they walk out of school. Um, and I think a transition uh, piece would be a great piece for future discussion. And I'm gonna stop there, but certainly start your Twitter account if you don't have one, get to know all your politicians, become locally involved with CEC and partner with other groups, other parent groups and other groups and help your parents to become lifelong advocates for their students and politically active. A hundred percent. I think too, um, there's a lot of the organizations, like I know CEC with the legislative su summit, what they were able to do, they actually create a letter for you. You type in your zip code. It tells you what who the person is um, in your your state and you can personalize that and it sends you and you get a receipt some sometimes it's just a matter of going to a place and finding what that m letter is um they did an amazing job with the social media with the hashtags and creating um a social um what do they call it the media kit and to kind of get those out so that it is the same image again and again and again and again and again and you're going to you know at the sen senators and the congress persons um and i think that that is you know a valuable thing um i think it's a little bit different for some people but i think it does matter so if you know that there's something that you're passionate about and you have a hub share that and get it out. So I know on learning revolution, that's kind of the idea of this whole group, right? There's so much out there in individual organizations. How can we kind of come together and find the things that we can help better, right? And so because it's international, you know, if I go to NJCEC, I might get a certain need met but there is a larger con context out there. And I mean, I really, I landed here because I was just searching for connection. It was the end of May. Nobody was talking about September and it scared me and I was worried and I needed, I'm a person, I like information. Information makes me feel good, okay? So not having that, I reached out. I said, is there any talk about special ed? And Steve said, you're going to do it. And I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm here, but it's not my voice. This is not me trying to, like, this is us, right? Because any advocacy special ed, we cannot do any of this alone. We need one another now more than ever. So if there's any way that you feel like this group could uh, help you, please know that every person in this room right now is somebody that you can reach out to. Um, you know, if you want to go through me to try to find it, we will, if we don't know it, we're going to find it. I think um, last week people came to me wanting to find answers. And since we kind of don't know what the answers are, we need to do it together. 
And maybe it's something innovative and outside of the box that nobody has kind of come up with. Don't be afraid because you're the expert in your field. You know your kids better than anyone else might. Not the senator. He does not know your stu student and the family and your community, but they should know. So is it, you know, letters, pictures, especially when we go back, one of the first things I'm going to do is take a selfie with my mask and the shield and the, and the d d divisions because that is going to be an interesting time. And, you know, can we effectively teach in that environment? Are we then addressing the actual needs of education or are we fulfilling a requirement just to get kids back in the building so parents can go back to work? Dot, dot, dot. Don't want to get too much into all that. But um, I think it's important to be said, like, what is our purpose right now if we're not keeping everybody safe and not taking unnecessary risks. Um, but Danny, I, I would love to know a little bit more just about your previous experiences and I guess how you feel you've made an impact and maybe something that you wish could be different. Well, I, uh, I don't want to, I want to make sure that we don't discredit things that people do on a local level and in their classroom. Um, advocating on a national level, a state level may not be for everyone. And it's something that, you know, they may not be comfortable with. So I certainly don't want to discredit any work that people are doing within their schools, within their district, just within their classroom. Um, you know, just thinking about the student that you really feel needs an evaluation for uh, a speech assessment or OT assessment, that's advocating for that child. Um, you know, if you know that there's additional resources that they need that you'll want the school to provide. That's advocating for the child. So anything that you do that helps further the success of your students, that's advocacy. And as you become more versed in it and more comfortable with it, that's when you can go a little further, maybe reach a little beyond your district, then maybe go to your state, then maybe go national. Whatever your comfort level is, whatever you do, you're definitely making a difference. Um, my very first experience on Capitol Hill, I can tell you I was shaking like a leaf. And even in our virtual uh, meetings that we had last week, I was still nervous. Um, so it's always that it's, it's always a little nerve wracking when you're speaking to someone of importance and you want to get a point across and to make your point heard. But I do feel that, and this is something that's always spoken about um, in cells and anytime I do any kind of advocacy, it's you bring yourself to them. So you bring your personal experiences and how your experiences are affecting it, you know, your students in the classroom. And that's what I'm gonna say cells um, in, in a term, that's, that's the hook. That's what makes that connection. Um, just by, you know, if you, you meet someone and say, I want you to pass HR 125-562. Okay, well, why? Um, but when you bring that personal connection, when we talk about um, social emotional learning, when we talk about our students, you know, when, when we had our conversation about funding for IDEA and listen, I have $75 to spend in my classroom for the entire year. That's what draws the hook of, oh my goodness, this really is a situation that, you know, others need to start looking at that we need to, you know, focus on our students. So bringing that, and I, I will say that once you start talking from your heart, um, I, I, I always get a bit calmer when I'm talking about my students, when I'm talking about my own children, because um, that's what I'm comfortable with, that's what I'm familiar with. I'm not a, a very political person at all, but I'm a teacher. And I think when anytime you're advocating on behalf of your, your students or even your children, you do what you do best and you teach. And the, uh, let the staffers in the office and our, the representatives that they're, they're serving, you want to teach them and be an educator. So anytime you go to advocate, just remember that, that you're the teacher that you're teaching from the heart and you're, you're showing them, you know, opening the doors to your classroom. 
Can I, can I jump in also? Absolutely. Yeah, that was really, you know, like uh, spot on. But we also have to think about when we work with parents, we're also helping them and advocate. When we explain to them what the process is like or hold their hands through meetings or, you know, just guiding them to find different support or different extra after school activities for them. I mean, that's such an important component that we cannot forget about because that's like hitting home right at the local level for the ones that need it. Um, you know, again, even people who are well-versed in special education don't always, you know, like they, they need guidance, they need help, they need support, they need someone else to turn to. So, you know, on so many levels, you know, we're so much more than just teachers. We definitely are advocates, whether, you know, I'll go back to the word you might have used, like the hardcore, you know, grassroots advocate going, you know, to Capitol Hill or the ones who are working day to day with our students and it really makes a difference. And in addition, you know, as you get, you know, like as you work with even older students, teaching them to advocate for themselves and how to, you know, like what they're going to do for college or, you know, postgraduate work or, you know, transition planning, how to make sure that their needs are being met and, you know, they, they know to ask for, you know, whatever it might be. Those are important skills and that's something we definitely need to work with our students on. Um, absolutely. Thank, thank you. Um, and I think too, you know, there's the law too. So like I went and went and got out some of my textbooks here, right? Rights law, they kind of have done so much work, Pam and uh, Pete, right? And what I love about this book, it's very much writ written for a parent to um, know what to do. But the title is From Emotions to Advocacy. And what's funny about that is that I feel like um, I didn't understand that until I had a son. And my son is currently speech delayed. He's two, he's in early in intervention. And all of the things that I've been trained to do and that I know and that I've read, I sat in that initial IFSP at my kitchen ta table and I didn't hear a word that they said. They showed me his results and he was so much lower than I ever expected and not a word that they said registered. And that's where I felt like I wish I had somebody else there to be like, just could you explain it to me again? Because your emotions just wipe out any rational thought because you fear the worst. Right. And, and, you know, what you've said is so important. When I was a child study team director, that was something I made sure my team always knew, is that I don't care who the person is on the opposite end of the table. First and foremost, they're a parent. They could be highly educated from Yale, Harvard. It doesn't matter. It's their baby that they're, that's being talked about. And everything, like you said, just goes out, out the door. You, you know, like, you could be a speech therapist yourself and just listening to another speech therapist talk about your child, your body literally goes cold turkey and, and your brain freezes and you're like, oh my God, I didn't think about that. Oh my God, is that my child? You know, like, and it's like you said, a wave of emotions and we can't forget that. And we have to realize and work with parents to make sure that they feel comfortable asking questions and that, you know, someone put in the chat, you know, like that we, that we, like I said before, we need to make sure that the kids feel comfortable to advocate for themselves also. I mean, this is, you know, again, it's not this big, big thing. It's if they feel comfortable saying something, but Rebecca, what you said is so true. And my heart goes out to you and to everyone else who has felt that way, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be feeling that way. That, that's not a good child study team meeting or an IFSP meeting or whatever you want to call it from whatever state or district you're with. But, um, we, we need to work harder at that to make sure people feel more comfortable. So thank you for sharing. Uh, um, so thinking about that as well, and some of the intersectionality pieces, the racial inequities right now, families that don't feel heard in the community, nonetheless, a child study team. You know, when one of our slides, you know, 80%, I think, of special education teachers currently are white. When we're telling these families that they need to do, you know, a, this serv a service or that, you know, how do we make sure that 
that is documented appropriately, that they feel comfortable asking the questions. Um, you know, I, it's something that I definitely have a huge question mark about. Um, originally, I wanted to do my master's thesis on the disproportionality of black males in special education. And I literally got told, if you pursue this, you will probably lose your job. So being a non-tenured person, I took a step back and I did something on, I don't know, inferential thinking that I could care less about. Um, but it's never kind of left. Like I, I, I want to know why and how we can advocate for them in a better way that we're not just slapping on you know, that this person has a disability when really what they need is something much different. Um, so if anybody would feel f f free to um, speak to that. I, um, I'll, I'll say something around that. I wrote my um, PhD dissertation just on that, that question, focusing on administrative support. Um, I really picked administrative support because I was looking at what are those things that a principal actually himself or herself has control over? What can she do to help um, teachers remain in our field? The number of young uh, teachers and even people who are approaching retirement who buy themselves out of, of uh, years so they leave the field, it's, it's a dramatic issue that um, nobody's even really talked about how this the COVID-19 situation is going to affect retention and recruitment of, of, of special educators uh, and paraprofessionals. I mean, I'm frightened to death to think what's going to happen um, to our paraprofessionals in, in, in the classrooms. Um, but basically, in a quick summary, what, it, what I found was that a to uh, looking at surveys and responses was this issue that of administrative support and, and loyalty index. There is this idea that if a special educator challenges an IEP team uh, or members of the team or an administrator, that there's an attack on this concept of loyalty. And I, I postulated that in fact, that loyalty index, if you have a situation where you have an administrator who doesn't see the value of special education, or in fact sees it as a, as a negative in their school, um, that sort of an attack could lead directly to um, long-term um, damage to that teacher's uh, ability to function in that school. Um, I was a paid advocate for, for close to six years. Um, I really wanted to be free, but I couldn't do it. Um, most states have some sort of paid advocacy group um, required under IDEA. Um, uh, so they're out there, but I can't tell you how many times a special education teacher turned out to be silent at the IEP meeting, but would slip me something in a parking lot or send me an email or give me a call. Um, and to be honest with you, in some instances, that might be the right move. Yeah. Um, uh Deb wrote that sometimes the child study team gets angry when a parent brings a support person or an, an ad advocate, um, but she feels that it gives the parents support to help them understand what their chi child needs. Um, so I've had an interesting career where I started as a liaison for a school district. So I was working on getting um, the child from the least restrictive environment from the home back to the school. Um, and I'm kind of happy I was so naive at the time, but you're talking about being in IEP meetings with 16 to 20 folks around with the lawyers. And I was told you do not speak. Um, and that was always hard because you're, but this is a team approach and we're all supposed to be in it together, like Rose, color glasses, Becca. That's not the case. Um, and then being on the, on the, you know, um, kind of private side working with the district and now seeing it from a district perspective and having gone through administrative courses, you know, I understand both sides. But there, but the, I guess, there's so much you can do prior to the meeting to make those two sides understand better before you get there and the errors are thick and then nothing gets solved. 
Um, and I think that there should be more administrators that do have a stronger understanding of special ed. Um, I feel like sometimes they forget that we exist. We're just like, oh good, we have this person, this person, they're gonna be in this room and uh, all right, that's taken care of. I can go on to uh, other things. And while I love being trusted as a professional, um, right now with COVID, we're seeing, wait a minute, these kids are the ones that need the most. Now we're gonna bring them back to school. We want them to get more face-to-face -face time because that's necessary for their education but is it right for them and just it just gets you know uh, uh, you know are we doing that because we're afraid you know that we just want to check the boxes or are we doing it because it really is the best for the kids that i don't know i wish i did um uh um, any other kind of thoughts you know rebecca one thing too that i'm i i like to air more on the proactive side than the reactive side. And I think a lot of a lot of things that we're seeing with our students may sometimes be kind of cut off at the pass if we have a very strong uh, response to intervention program. Um, you know, one that that has that multi tiered system that incorporates the academics and the behavior with it that we can you know on the onset as soon as we see a child that's struggling that we are on them we are helping them we are giving them their supports we're documenting you know we're really creating this information rich portfolio on this child so that way we can help best move them forward um, especially when it comes to behaviors as well and it seems that not all districts have a very strong program and a lot of times that may be where kids are getting lost in the shuffle, um, where they may not be making that progress, where the team might not be as strong, where, um, you know, the, the materials that they're using. And a lot of times that's when it's, oh, get them tested, get them tested. So I think, uh, you know, to be proactive looking at, um, looking at RTI and how we can support our students earlier. And when I think about, um, you know, when we talk about diversity and, and issues that students may be having at home that may tie into those behaviors in the classroom, a lot of times giving them that extra support, you know, moving them up on that tier as they need it, that often is, is what they need. Um, so I would encourage people to look at that too. Yeah, I, I, I would hope that um, Roseanne said is, you know, the smaller the numbers are perhaps we'll be able to really get in there to see the kids. I mean, I know being remote and one on one, I was able to track my data because I was with them and I saw very specifically how they thought and what they did. And it was like, oh, why can't I do this all the time? Like, I thought that with my students being at the high school level, the ones that did sign, sign on, we were able to accomplish, I think, more. And I think that remote learning isn't necessarily bad all the way around. I think there's definitely things that we can improve upon. Um, but, you know, what is the best for that child? What is, like, we can't just think about their scores, right? We have to think about, are they had, is there food? in the home are mom and dad working and they're not able to get them up and and knowing the full story i feel like before we kind of knew who was free and reduced and that's a private thing i feel like this is forcing us to really know our fam families in, in such a deeper way is it a lot more work and more emotionally taxing absolutely um, I'm, I'm gonna say that this has probably been the past six months the worst sleep that i think it like having a baby or COVID, I, like they're right there <laughs> because you're just constantly, what else can I do? Um, and I think that the connections reaching out, I mean, I'm, I've been amazed because everybody's here. We're locked in computer screen. Let's go link like LinkedIn saying, I don't know the answer. I want to reach out to somebody who maybe had a similar thought or an ex experience. We're all isolated physically, 
but this is such a time to connect because we're all here. Like I would, you know, like we're not going to the con conventions and going to the small meetings where I can meet some someone like Ted, you know, but now he's someone that I met back in 2011. I gave him a call, said, hey, I'm doing this show. You Do you remember like when we met? He's like, oh my God, yes. And here he is now and being able to speak with you. And that's how our connections grow. That's how we become stronger. Um, and it's at the end of the day, we're here because we care. And I feel like so many times I'm like, I want to make a difference, but how, right? It's the connection. It's, it's, you know, it's the small things to the large things I fought pers personally. I'm not sure if I can be more effective in my classroom of five, or do I go and pursue some other degree so I can go, you know, big what's going to be the what's going to have the most impact on the lives and you know the more i think about it like i'm i'm currently i'm doing the thing that people tell you not to do i work and live in in the same town and people are like oh you don't want to do that you're going to go to the grocery store you know well now with masks and stuff it's a little bit diff different but like i enjoy that i go to the farmers market and i see my families and we talk and we chat and we make connections and they know my son that brings such joy to me and makes me feel connected so that I do have that side conversation and realize that they're struggling more than I ever thought. Yeah. Um, you know, that once again, that's not for ev everyone. And sometimes I wish my, I think my husband does wish that we lived far in a mountain somewhere, you know, because it's a lot. And I do take, take things, you know, home with me. Um, but um, I, I just think it's, um, it's such a time for these connections in any way. Um, and, you know, we're in a situation where those connections are actually dangerous in the sense of the manifestation of the disease can only take place in proximity. So when we're in a situation where we have a group of students who are consistently needing emotional and, and, and sometimes literal support to, to function in society, who are now in a position of many being medically fragile, of actually that support possibly being dangerous. And that thinking and that mentality and that need, which is even greater if you think about it. I mean, it's a scary world if you walk out there and everyone's wearing a mask. You, you know, we were teaching um, this, this concept of social stories and this idea of helping to under, help our students learn and, and improve their emotional IQ. But we, I never taught anyone how to, to read someone's emotions with a mask on. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I didn't teach about eye lines, but that's the only way you can tell. So um, I made a list of some things that I thought were really important um, to share with everyone of things that you need to really think about as we all move into a new world and a new way of doing things this fall. And one of those was the importance of connection. Um, from some of these students, you are going to be the only new person or voice they've heard for God, three months, uh, you have a very important task right now of really analyzing your students' emotional well-being. And some parents are probably on the end, end of, of what they can handle. Um, I said also on my list was the importance of planning. Um, the unknown is going to be out there and the way you've always done things might not work. So the importance of planning and willingness to change your plans and to give yourself some space for healing. Um, the importance of compassion. I can't stress that one so, so much. And I don't just mean compassion for them, but compassion for yourself. It is, if you're going to advocate, you've got to start with self-advocating. And that means allowing yourself to, to be vulnerable, to um, there's a list going around now of 12 different um, characteristics of people under stress and, and trauma. And, and one of those is um, a guilt, a guilty feeling that you're not working hard enough or, or you know, um, fear. 
I mean, we are all going through a lot. So you have to not only be compassionate of others, but of yourself and your family. Um, the importance of modeling behaviors. I can't, you know, it's interesting. I live in South Carolina. I've been here 20 years. We've got a huge movement against masks in this state. And inevitably, the, the interesting point to me is that we have parents who are modeling some very negative behaviors who are then going to be sending their students back to school, teaching them they don't need to wear masks. I can only imagine um, the emotional behavior disorders and those students who um, have behavior problems in that scenario. It's going to be an amazing challenge to our administrators. And then finally, the last thing I want to leave with is the importance of dreams. All of our students, we all have dreams, and there's going to be a fear that this is going to steal their dreams. Um, don't let that happen. I really think it's important to reassure our students that there's still going to be a future for you, and, and things are going to get better. And don't let those dreams die. I can't say how important someone's dreams are. Um, and I just wanted to end on that note, allow your dreams and allow their dreams to still flourish. Without hope, we have nothing. Thank you so much. I think I needed to hear that my, myself and I, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, any last thoughts, Dr. Good or Danny? Rebecca, could I jump in oh, and just say something for a second? Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> and yeah, go ahead, is, Wayne. Yeah, this is my, my name is Wayne. I knew Rebecca way back when. Uh, I'm a retired teacher uh, where Ted was talking about uh, almost ancient. He is not, but I am. Uh, <laughs> so I've, I've been around for, for a while. Uh, but a centerpiece of, of what I do, I think it, when I hear you talking in the language that you have and where you are, uh, with your interactions with, with, with your students, uh, you're all doing what we do, uh, which is real world experiential learning type of things. Uh, our age range is like 14 to 18 with what we do uh, on, a, on a global level uh, with things. And I've seen kids today uh, do some amazing things. I have one autistic child now uh, at, at the school. Uh, I'm at Chestnut Hill College where Rebecca used to. Uh, and she came in as an intern. She was in a, in a shell. Everybody accepted her with open arms. And she just was fabulous with, with what, she, what she did with a big area of, of interest that, that, that she had connected to climate change, which is what we've been working on. So uh, if, there's, if there's a session that you're having coming up, you know, that would look at, you know, real world experiential learning uh, and, and things like that, I'd love to get into the mix regarding things like uh, developing perspectives, uh, looking at uh, communication as, as a key to uh, living well in the world today, uh, uh, and, and, and the whole cross-cultural pieces that, that are there in the big picture of the, of the world that all these students have that you're, that you're, that you're working with. Uh, and, There'd be opportunities maybe with some things that I would, I would uh, talk about there. You might have some students that could fit into something that we're, that we're doing um, and it wouldn't cost them anything to do it. We, mm -hmm. I, I could explain some of that in, in a session if you had absolutely uh, time like this. Yeah, yeah no, ab absolutely. So we are here every Wednesday at 2 until I guess I go back. I guess. I'm not really sure. I think Wednesdays is, is a work from home day right now, so I don't know what that looks like. Um, it's really important, I think, just to kind of maintain this. I think I personally am going to need this when the school year starts, just to have that connection and that ability to kind of be like, oh my god, this happened, and then what did you, you do? And I really want this to be more of a um, a forum for dis discussion um, and for I ideas. Um, but Wayne, absolutely, I think that there's a lot. Um, so Wayne works directly with the United Nations with his N NGO, um, and he is the person that opened the door, and I think I kind of ran through it. Um, <laughs> and so now I'm, I'm, I've, you know, I- There we go. 
able I, to do a I, lot more. I, I love found, to see your face. I, I finally found the switch. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, yeah so um, I, you know, uh, those of you who are looking for anything on a global scale, I do know that we have some people here from another country and a lot of what we talked about today was United States focused. Uh, please know that I do have some great connections for you and that um, if you're looking to do something that we can um, talk about that as well. Um, so we are past our time. I am going to um, sign off here today. Um, if you want to stick around to ask questions, feel free. Uh, but this was exceptional circumstances for exceptional learners helping us to navigate, accommodate, and advocate. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Nice to meet you, everybody. My pleasure. <laughs>